So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Welch Center Clinical Research Grand Rounds. My name is Tangelo Purnell. I'm one of the core faculty members here at the Welch Center. I'm also one of the associate directors at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity, which is serving as our co-sponsor for today's Grand Rounds lecture. Um, we are very excited. We have a very um, high demand speaker who's doing some amazing work. And I just wanted to mention that Dr. Nai Yu Wong and I are the um, faculty co-coordinators for the month of May for the Welch Center Grand Rounds. And so at this time, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Lisa Cooper, who is going to introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you all. I'm Lisa Cooper. I'm one of the core faculty members in the Welch Center and also director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Arturo Casadeval. He is a professor of medicine in uh, the John Chopin School of Medicine. He also is a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, he serves as chair of the W. Harry Feinstein Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And Dr. Casa Deval is an internationally recognized expert uh, in infectious diseases. Uh, his work has been recognized with numerous awards. I couldn't even list them. I couldn't name them all. They were, they were so many, but I'll mention a few. Um, he is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, he is a member of the um, of ASCI, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, as well as the uh, American Association of Physicians. And he's going to be talking with us today about some very exciting work that he and his team are leading on uh, a trial. Well, actually, it's he said it's a it's a project, uh, a convalescent plasma therapy uh, project for COVID-19. And as we all know, um, we are looking, desperately looking for solutions and treatments for this devastating infection at this point in time. So Dr. Casadeval is at the cutting edge of this work and we are just honored to have him with us today. Dr. Casadeval. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. Thank you, Tanjala, for all your help uh, in getting here. Uh, this is a new seminar and it is a project. It is an ongoing project as you're about to hear. Uh, so I will be updating you on things that are happening, uh, but just, just to let you know that uh, the clinical trials are ongoing and a lot of the information you're gonna receive is a anticipatory of that. So I don't have any disclosures. Plasma is not gonna be a product that's gonna be sold. Uh, it is, however, uh, an ancient, uh, an old therapy. And what I thought I'd begin with is a brief history of antibody therapies, because uh, I've been working on antibodies for 30 years. I'm very interested in antibody function, structural function problems, but I think what makes me a little different in the field is that I'm very interested in history. And this entire idea came from, I certainly didn't invent it, this came from the past. Um, so the story of antibody begins in 1891, that's 130 years ago in which these two individuals, Emil von Behring and Shiva Saburo Kirasako, carried out a dramatic experiment that was to change the course of medicine and immunology. They immunized um, uh, bunnies with either diphtheria or tetanus toxins, and they showed that the, the bunnies made specific immunity that could be transferred by transferring the serum. This was the cutting edge work of its day. Uh, for the first time, the idea that you could just transfer immunity uh, was this was a time in which there were no really vaccines, immunology was not understood, and it led to the concept of humoral 
uh, immunity. Humoral comes from the humors, the, 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 the blood and plasma. This uh, immediately was used for the great killer of the day, diphtheria. Uh, the here you see uh, Goya's Lazarillo de Tormes, and this is a horrible disease that many parents saw their children die in front of them, a horrible death of asphyxiation. And in the 1890s, within years of that observation, uh, passive theory was developed. And I want to read you a quote from the time, which will be relevant to today because it gives you a sense, A, how, how rapidly antibody works. I found the boy very ill, the whole back of the belt, or throat being like a white velvet. This is the membrane that asphyxiated children. I had never used the new remedy before, but determined to try it to save the boy's life. I injected a small quantity under the skin of the stomach and watched the throat. I can only compare that to the marvelous result of the disappearance of snow be beneath a hot sun. After the second dose, every trace of the membrane disappeared and the boy soon recovered. It's an anecdote, but it, it, it tells you how it affected this physician and saved the boy's life. I'm also telling you this because one of the things I want to convey is that when antibody works, it works often very rapidly. And some of the anecdotes, and I'm going to tell you about COVID-19, one needs to keep that in that regard. So Bomberian went on to get the first Nobel Prize for serum therapy, especially its application against hysteria. It's interesting, uh, they, didn't, they did not give it to his collaborator, Japanese collaborator. We don't really know why that's not the case, but, but uh, no, uh, Nobel had a and it stipulated it could only be given to one, so it was only after that that they began sharing the Nobel Prizes. But in, rea in reality, it should have been shared, and certainly history, and those who know the history, credit them both. So this was big pharma around 1910. Very rapidly, uh, people began to try to make serums against anything. To, they tried to make serums against cancer. Well, that didn't work, but it worked against a lot of other diseases. The, the word truth serum, where does that come from? It comes from this era. It was the era that if you could just get the right immunogen you, and you could just make the right serum, you could do anything, including make people talk. So did it work? Well, about 30 years ago, I spent a year reviewing all that data. I wrote a paper, and the answer is yes, it did work. Uh, it cut the mortality of pneumococcal pneumonia by half. It cut the mortality of meningococcal meningitis by half. And this is the antibody they used to give it directly to the spinal column. Uh, they, the first controlled trials ever done were done with antibody. And they didn't do double blind or randomized. What they did is they would take one word and they would treat it with antibody and not give it to the other word. Uh, and that would be a, an example of one word serving as control as the other. This was early days in medicine. The statistics had not been developed yet before many of these studies. But when I went back and I analyzed them, with the two statistical tools of today, they were statistically significant. So the antibody sources came from two places. One was animal, horse, chicken, and yes, chicken, and rabbit were used to produce large amounts of, of serum. Different companies had different serums and they all competed on, the, on their presumed quality. And this could be used for bacterial diseases because you can have a bacteria and you can infect a chicken, you can infect a rabbit and collect the, the the uh, serum, but you couldn't do that with a viral disease because human viruses are not gonna replicate in horses. So for those, they had human convalescent serum. And this was for diseases with no animal model, primarily viral diseases, but there was always the problem of, of supply and logistics. Try to think through an epidemic in those days. How would you basically identify who may have antibody when the antibodies died at tests were very primitive, and they certainly had no knowledge of blood-associated diseases like hepatitis. And this is what part of the reason that convalescent sera will come to an end in the middle of the 20th century, primarily with the discovery of the hepatitis. Serum therapy was difficult to use. You needed to know what you were doing. It was not writing on the chart, penicillin, 500 milligram, or how many units uh, of every number of hours. You needed to type the organism. You needed to match the serum to the organism and then to administer. And remember, they didn't have IV sets. So almost everything had to be done by injection. You put an injection on it. The doctor had to sit by the bedside because sometimes the horse serum gave you immediate hypersensitivity reactions. 
and also you had the phenomenon of serum sickness, which was 10 to 14 days later, when people mounted an antibody response to the, to the horse materials. So what happened around 1940, 1935, sulfonamides are introduced. In 1942, you have to first use of penicillin. So chemotherapy changes the game completely. Uh, it's cheap compared to serum therapy. It's easy to use. You just write an order. You don't have to stand by the bedside. You don't have to make a specific diagnosis. So phonomides will work against many different types of bacteria. It's got low toxicity, whereas the toxicity of serum therapy, primarily from animal sources, could be relatively high. And a bout of serum therapy could, be, will, could, could get a person sick for a while. There was a, a lot of lot variation in serum, but there was none when it came to the chemicals. And the source of one was animals, the other one was fermentation or chemical synthesis. Clearly, the advantage went to chemotherapy. And now you can begin to see why the antibody therapies are abandoned in infectious diseases, primarily because they could not compete against the chemotherapy, even though in the twilight between the two eras, people carried out studies showing that the combination was always better than either. And that could have major implications for COVID-19 because the antivirals come in, we may do very well in combining the two. Uh, this is something that I, I dug up from an old slide. I always been waiting for age three. So the first age in antimicrobial therapy is serum, then is chemotherapy. Age three is when we learn to use immunomodulators and we take care of the x-axis I'm about to tell you. But before that, you had prayer. And if you compare prayer to chemotherapy, they differ only in that the efficacy of one is uncertain and the efficacy of the other is certain because certainly you can use the same prayer for many diseases, the complexity is low, the cost is cheap, uh, but it's something to think about, in particular when uh, you begin to think about anecdotes. As late as 1944, Osler's Principles and Practice of Medicine recommended nine years of Tesolda, sulfur use, uh, serum therapy for anthrax, tetanus, plague, tularemia, diphtheria, shigella, meningococcal meningitis, scarlet fever, and pneumococcal pneumonia. Notice that there are no viruses there, primarily because viral diseases were generally dealt with, they were epidemic, and they were generally dealt during the epidemic, as I'm about to show you. So the heyday is between, I would say, 1900 and 1940, and then it crashes. And the, the sad thing is that in, in a way, it crashes at a time in which there were major uh, discoveries in antibody technology. For example, the cone fractionation is invented in the 1940s. That allows to separate the antibodies from the plasma. And had that been available, you could imagine much less lower toxicity uh, and higher activity um, of formulations. So for the rest of the 20th century, antibody therapies in infectious disease kind of creep along. They begin to be immune globulins for certain things. And recently, there have been a couple of monoclonal antibodies that have been licensed. But the great explosion of monoclonal antibody therapy never happens in infectious disease. It happens in other fields like oncology and rheumatology. And the question is why? Well, it's, it's a very complex question that is worth maybe a seminar in itself. But suffice it to think about it is that in cancer, you often had no alternative. And in rheumatology, the therapies with steroids were often significantly worse. Whereas any time if you try to bring an antibody therapy to an infectious disease, you're gonna to have to be competing with drugs. So even though we have antimicrobial resistance, and even though the efficacy of drugs is lowering, it's still the economic hurdle to bring in a monoclonal antibody therapy has been a great, although I'm, I'm hopeful that this uh, will change in the next few years. So what are the lessons from the serum therapy era? Antibody uh, therapy was effective for the, ther oops, by the way, I made this slide like at four o'clock in the morning, so you, can, you may see some issues with them. Uh, but let's just say that antibody therapy was effective. The efficacy depending on timing, the earlier the better. In contrast to drugs that you could often give when people were very sick, antibodies had to be given earlier. And this was a problem because uh, especially if a patient arrives in your care when they were already uh, quite ill. The efficacy depended on the amount. A certain amount was needed. 
that I think stands to reason that you got to provide a certain amount of antibody uh, to, to get an effect. They were well tolerated. We, and this is a point that has been lost to history. Recovery was often rapid. For pneumococcal pneumonia, recovery was faster with antibody than with penicillin. And what we think in retrospect, we don't know the answer to this, is that when antibody worked, it neutralized a lot of uh, bacterial products. And the net result was a net uh, feeling better because these bacterial products probably trigger the cytokines and the things that make us feel ill. And establishing efficacy require controlled clinical trials, not controlled trials as we know them today, but they were controlled in their way. And, I, and for those of you who only believe data that comes from a randomized controlled trial, I will remind you that the antimicrobials came into clinical use without going through those trials. They came as a result of case series. Now, we would not go, we would not tolerate that today, but it, it's also important to think that, that the epistemic value of case series that we now put down as well, they don't have the right control, wait, this and that, is in fact, it sometimes does give you the right answer. So let's talk about convalescent plasma for infectious diseases and COVID-19. So what is convalescent plasma? It is the liquid in the blood that holds the cells. It is obtained by separating the cells from the liquid. Now, when you look at the history of this field, in the past they used sera because they often let it clot and then they, they would spin down. It differs from sera in that it contains the clotting factor. It can be obtained from donors by plasma freezes and it is obtained by standard transition practices. And this is what a bag looks like. For the purposes of this talk, a unit of plasma is gonna be about 250 cc's and this is what people have been receiving. The, the active agent is specific antibody. In the case of COVID-19, it's gonna be virus-specific immunoglobulin, which develops late in disease and the early convalescent period. It includes both IgM and IgG, and sometimes IgA. We can measure IgA in some of this uh, serum. So uh, this is gonna be an issue because when you generate the immune globulin, you're not gonna have the other isotypes. And the question is how these two preparations are compare. The IgG, the human has a half-life of about 20 days. That could become very important in prophylaxis in that you can, by giving a urine to an individual with sufficient antibody, you could protect them for a while. It's a complex uh, mixture of antibodies and it includes both effect, the effective immunoglobulins include both neutralizing antibody, that is antibody that if you add to a tissue culture plate, for example, prevents the virus from infecting the cells, and non-neutralizing antibodies. These are different, and they mediate antiviral functions through IgG receptors, such as antibody dependence, cellular cytotoxicity, known as ADCC, phagocytosis, complement activation. The bottom line is, Sierra has been both. But in generally, we've been trying to focus on neutralizing antibody because it can be measured, it can be measured very rigorously, and the, and the thought that you're giving them something that actually kills the virus is uh, quite reassuring. In particular, because there have been reports in the literature that sometimes when virus is going to cells through the FC receptor, they are not killed, and rather it could lead to the phenomenon of antibody dependent enhancement. How do antibodies work? They are multifunctional molecules. They do a lot of things. Uh, here is a, a, a line. Uh, they, can, they have direct antimicrobial activity. The ADCC, as I mentioned, they are the only compounds that we have for toxin and viral neutralization. That there's the entire virion. They activate complement, they promote oxygenization, they promote the generation of oxygen locally, that damages microbe, and they often reduce damage to the host from the inflammatory response. And they people often don't think that they are very important immunomodulators. Uh, I want to digress for a minute to talk about something that Lizanne Porowski and I developed 20 years ago, which is the damage response framework. This is the only theory in microbial pathogenesis that accounts for the host and the microbe. And look, it's very simple. For most my host microbe interactions, the result is a parabola. You get into trouble in weak responses, you get into trouble in strong responses. For most infectious diseases, the outcome is asymptomatic. That means that the host damage doesn't reach the level in which you have uh, affects homeostasis. Uh, recently, we have just submitted a paper in which we use this to analyze the COVID-19 
uh, uh, pathogenesis. And you can see you can break people into three groups, presenting with disease. Many of these have what people are calling predisposing factors, factors that affect immunity in some way. So they can mount weaker antibody responses that lead to, we think, to the proliferation of the virus that then triggers an exuberant inflammatory responses that puts it at the other end of the parabola. And that's the arrow that, uh, that you have here. And then you also have the compensated disease. So the majority of people are in group two. They have some damage, but it's not sufficient to meet the threshold for disease. And then you have the whole range, moderate disease, cytokine storm, respiratory death, a failure, and if you have sufficient damage, you have death. So think about antibodies. I've been able to move individuals in this parabola. If you take uh, an individual with a weak immune response and you're able to give them a pro-inflammatory antibody or one that enhances the immune response, you can move that individual into this direction. You, this will be the, what would happen if you took an asymptom, a vulnerable person and you gave them a shot of antibody and then they became subsequently infected, they would not perhaps have disease. Similarly, individuals at this end of the, some antibodies reduce inflammation and they, and they function to reduce the inflammatory response. In particular, certain types of IgG, they could move the individual in this, par in this parabola, uh, in the, this direction to a different place in the parabola. The bottom line of this is antibodies are very complex molecules. They come in all kinds of flavors. They are, some are pro-inflammatory, some are anti-inflammatory, they do a lot of things, and it's one part of immunology that is often neglected, but antibody-mediated immunity is very complex and remains poorly understood. So one of the principles of convalescence here in use, very easy. You find a patient, you wait till they recover, then you, you take away, you get a blood draw and you get the plasma. Then you, you, you measure for, for virus antibody, if you have the assay for viral neutralization, that would be optimal, and then you can use it for prophylaxis. You could give it to an individual, like a healthcare worker, who's had a major exposure or is, is expected or, or has some particular vulnerability, or you can use it for therapy. So convalescent sera was used in many of the past epidemics. It was used in 1918, and the doctors at the time believed that it worked, and they, re they believed that it reduced mortality by as much as 50%. It was used to break epidemics. And I'm gonna basically mention this case, this paper from 1934, the use of convalescent sera in a, in a prep school in Pennsylvania. The school, which is known as the Hill School in Potsdam, Pennsylvania, is still there. And in the bottom, you will see the use of, as late as 1946, uh, the use of convalescent sera to stop outbreaks of mumps. Uh, when polio would sweep into American cities, uh, convalescent sera was used. Uh, it often was taken from the parents and given to the children, um, again, without any knowledge of titers. But the data was, it, it varied in epidemics, but when it worked, it was uh, striking. Uh, I want to show you some data from 1918 uh, so you get a sense of what this looked like. So here you have a soldier, uh, it's an officer who's basically getting worse. Look at the respiratory rate. It's, um, this is day 27 of illness. Um, and they administer the serum and the very rapid uh, benefit. Now, you could say it's an anecdote, you could say it's own control, but again, you see this kind of effects that when it works, it tends to work rapidly. So uh, someone actually, he's a collaborator of mine, although I wasn't collaborating with him at the time, did a meta-analysis of all the studies from the 19, early 1910s and 20s that were published and came to the conclusion, did a meta-analysis of convalescent sera using the tools of today and came to the conclusion that yes, it did have an effect. Uh, in the, like going forward a little in the 20th century, convalescent sera has been used for the treatment of hemorrhagic fever in the 70s. Uh, here is, for example, a control study uh, they have 188 cases. They use immune plasma in 90, and the one person in 90 died. They used normal plasma in 81, and 16 died, and that was statistically significant. Hemorrhagic fever in Argentina has gone down significantly since the introduction of a vaccine that is used in the southern part of South America and affected countries. 
but this again gives you another viral disease in which it is used being used for therapy. Uh, so uh, in the H1N1 epidemic, uh, it was uh, used. This was about 10 years ago. And again, um, in this case, uh, one of the best studies is from, I was used in Hong Kong. Uh, it's in very severe pandemic influenza. So these are intubated patients. These are patients that I personally wouldn't think that antibody would work because I would think that the problem is um, is already extensive tissue damage, and this is, but guess what? They reduce mortality by about 50%. And there's another study, in this case, they had less of an effect. Uh, they had to do subgroup analysis and reduce mortality and just barely made statistical significance. Um, many of these are done emergently. They were done in the middle of an epidemic, but it gives you a feel for what uh, this literature looks like. So has it been used for the coronavirus? Well, it was used in 2003. Again, uh, convalescent serum was used uh, for patients in Hong Kong. Uh, you can see that the discharge rate among those that was used was significant three times the ones that was not used. Again, all the problems of lack of a control study, but is suggestive of efficacy. And it's been used with the Merck coronavirus, uh, where it's anecdotal but the efficacy has been more difficult to assess. So Wuhan, 2019, January, I am increasingly worried about that this is getting to the United States and it's just a matter of time and uh, that this is not gonna be containable. And I happen to be an aficionado to the history of medicine and to in particular to antibody-based therapies. And I get increasingly distressed because I hear no one talking about plasma therapy. Uh, you hear about vaccines, you hear about rushing antivirals, you hear about monoclonal antibodies, people want to develop them, but you don't hear anything about plasma. And the question was, how do I get the word out? Well, I could have gone to medical journal, but medical journals were not going to work in this situation. So early February, I wrote an op-ed, and I tried the usual suspect. I tried the New York Times, didn't want it. The Wall Street Journal didn't want it. But fortunately, the Wall Street Journal took it. and. Um, and this was a big break, and this is what it looked like, because once you have an op-ed, you can, people will re respond to it. They won't necessarily respond to another review paper or position paper in a medical journal. But here was in 650 words, uh, an essay that this, that plasma could be used. And in fact, I began by citing that school because I knew that it, it had the potential of grabbing the imagination. This was a prep school. The kids were susceptible to measles. Um, one kid had had the measles, but, but there had been a, uh, a breakdown in isolation, such that the doctor felt that all the kids had been exposed. So then he began to take serum from the, ba from the kid that was, uh, had recovered and used it on the, to prevent the infection, uh, the disease. And he gave him as little as 10 cc's. Was con a dose of 10 cc was considered adequate for members of this age group. There were, I believe, teenagers. And the epidemic was pretty much stopped in its track. They would have expected at least 25% of the group, based on historical experience, they ended up with only two kids having very mild measles. Uh, so um, I felt that this was the way to lead it. And in fact, it worked. Um, a lot of uh, reporters got very interested. They actually looked this person up. It turns out that Dr. Roswell Gallagher went on to become a major leader in adolescent care in the United States. And, uh, and what I did was I then took that op-ed, the 650 words, they rewrote it for me. They did a much better job than I could ever do. Uh, and I pasted it because, you know, the Wall Street Journal is paywall, so I couldn't send them the link. So I pasted an email. I just began sending it to my friends. I figured that I got to find, we got to do this in some way. And I don't know, I sent it to, to people I knew in government, but I, but I didn't get much of a response. So here's an example of an email exchange on February 28th. This is with Michael Joyner, who, um, who is going to become very important in the next couple of months in this effort. So uh, you can see my email. 
Uh, I wrote to our, the, uh, thanks, Mike. I wrote to our people here, here hoping to put some protocols in place in case it is needed. I'm worried that when this hits Baltimore, it's going to take out the ER personnel and administering a few CCs of convalescent serum to staff could protect them, certainly with mother blood banking techniques, getting 10 CCs of convalescent serum or less is less risky than getting the coronavirus. Anyway, uh, you may want to have uh, similar discussions at Mayo. I'm attaching the 1935 papers so you see how this was done. Warm regards Arturo, and a friend. Uh, this is what he does the next day. He sends it to all the people at Mayo and they immediately begin to organize. And I reach out to my friends in New York, my friends across the state, and then this, this community begins to reach out to others. And within days, uh, my inbox blows up as hundreds of people begin writing, well, how do you do this? How are we gonna do it? And I realized that, that we had a problem, that an op-ed can be a, something you react to, but what you really need is now an academic article. So this just gives you the timeline. So the Wall Street op-ed, here is email traffic. And we begin to have discussions with Hawkins ID on the first week of March. The Hawkins team assembled very rapidly. Shmuel Shoham, Aaron Tobian, Evan Block, Andy Pecco, Shabra Klein, David Sullivan. And I will tell you that these are some of the finest people I've ever uh, worked with. In that very first call in the morning at seven o'clock with ID, because it was the only time we could all uh, get together, uh, Shmuel said, hey, you know, I have an old protocol. Um, somebody's requesting remote control my screen. I decline. Um, so, it, discussion. Uh, so, uh, he wrote and says, I have a protocol that I use for influenza. I will adapt it. And he just began working on the protocol. And Aaron Tobian and Evan Block began looking at, uh, at how to do the, the actual transfusions. Uh, and then, um, and then, uh, Andy Peko, Sabra Klein, mobilized to put in virology things. Uh, I'm getting a uh, comment that says, Brooke Williams host is requesting remote control of your screen. Uh, and I'm declining and he keeps asking me. So if somebody's doing that, maybe you can stop. Um, I, can, I think I can keep going otherwise. And then, so discussions with ID, the realization that we needed a real manifesto. So I reached out to my friend, a longtime collaborator, Lucy Amparovsky at Einstein, and we wrote a paper in four days, which will become the JCI paper. As of today, a month later, it already has like 80 citations. It may become the most cited paper in my life. Uh, and then uh, together with Mike Joyner and a couple of other friends, we created the National Convalescent Plasma Project on the third week of March. I'll tell you more about that. And then everything is happening. New York is in deep trouble. Uh, we are talking to the FDA, uh, and then the, in March 24th, the FDA allowed compassionate use, uh, which, as you know, is limited because the patients have to be quite sick. But the situation in New York was rapidly deteriorating, and some of the hospitals there basically said, we are going to use it, and we'll take the risk, whatever the legal risk is. And I think the combination of pressure that they have nothing else to give, that this could potentially be useful, that it was not likely to be toxic, led the FDA by March 27. Uh, there was a, uh, well, I should say in March 27, the first patients were treated in Methodist Hospital and within two weeks, an extended use IND is put out by the FDA that pretty much gives physicians a lot of latitude uh, when to use it. So let me tell you about the National COVID-19 Plasma Project. This is the group. This was the early, you could say, the early people who responded to the emails that we just began to have conference calls. Uh, in particular, I want to. I'm noting Michael Joyner uh, and Nigel Panis. Nigel Panis is an epidemiologist at Michigan State University. Uh, we had we were be getting enormous numbers of requests for protocols. Shmu was getting um, the emails from all over the world. Uh, the Mayo Clinic was developing a therapeutic protocol, and the question was, you know, how do you distribute this? So we felt we needed a website. Uh, the dean of Michigan State University, uh, uh, a school of public health, said, put it up, and we'll worry about the lawyers later. Uh, so that's an example how rapid 
individuals were able to make rapid decisions here in which, they, in which allow this to move much more rapidly uh, otherwise. And the net result was that the, the, the website is hosted uh, at Michigan uh, State University by Nigel Panis. Um, industry stepped in to help. The Mitra Corporation, held up, uh, uh, which represents a conglomerate of 800 corporations in the country, uh, reached out to us and we said, look, you know, we're a bunch of academics. We need websites, we need communications and all that. So they reached out to Amazon and Amazon said, we'll give you the people. And Amazon within days created a very sophisticated website that is even collecting data, for example, trying to match people with uh, where their locations so where they can go and donate. So, and the protocols went up, uh, it provided a, a nexus for communication as things were ha now beginning to happen very rapidly in, in late March, uh, early April. So the FDA is on the move also. On March 24, they allow compassionate use. On April 3rd, Hopkins is granted permission for clinical trials in high-risk individuals. So if you want to think about the universe of this, Hopkins is focused on the outpatient part of the equation. The other hospitals are using the Mayo IND are focused on the in-hospital part of the equation. Of course, we can treat patients in the hospital, but in terms of the clinical trials that will go forward, the, this is kind of in a division of labor, and it grew out of the interest of the people here and the people there, like for example, Dave Thomas, the head of the of the um, a division of ID on the first meeting said, you know, you're, you're right, this is gonna work best if given early, let's focus on prophylaxis. And therefore the early protocols focus on prophylaxis. So Hopkins went for the IND and went for the permissions on the, on the outside hospital place. April 3rd, the gates open up. The FDA allows expanded access of convalescent zero for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, so what you, the way it works is doctors just have to register the patient, put information in, and this, this will now become very important in judging the early efficacy data. The, uh, and then they can go and put an order in and try to get the plasma. Uh, April 8th, uh, the FDA provided very extensive recommendations now, and basically as we were learning of what was happening, and all these documents are on the F FDA website, and I just want to say that the, F the FDA has been a great partner in this. These are, we have had great discussions with Peter Marks, Nicole Berdon, uh, and uh, it's been one of those things in which uh, the regulators and the users and everyone else has totally been on the same page. And the question has been how to not but. And, uh, and, and it's been a, a great relationship and I have nothing but praise uh, for my uh, colleagues in government and all the agencies uh, that we have dealt with. So April 3rd, the expanded protocol, uh, it allows patients have to be at least 18 years old. They need to have a laboratory confirmed diagnosis. And that becomes important as well as a hurdle because remember, we have a problem with testing. So not everybody can get tested uh, in the early days, uh, but you needed to meet that criteria. They needed to be hospitalized. The, uh, this IND was being held at Mayo, and uh, this was the in-hospital IND. It was severe or life-threatening uh, disease, as judged by the treating provider to be a high risk of progression to severe or life-threatening disease. That's an important thing, because now some of the doctors begin using it earlier in the course of disease. They begin using it in patients who they think are going to deteriorate. And some of the best anecdotes that we have has been in that realm. Mayo Clinic holds the IND and plasma use in the United States begins to grow exponentially. Uh, and I'll tell you what exponentially means in a minute. Yep. So by mid-April, these are the number of sites that are registered with us that had downloaded protocols, that had approached the IRB, and that were in discussions. I just imagine the email traffic uh, because as we were associated with this, uh, and all these were physicians, and in many cases were patients, people that needed, uh, one needed to answer uh, their requests. So the first publication I told you about, we needed a manifesto, we needed something to get out there. And here the Journal of Clinical Investigation 
it, which I just want to say I'm deputy editor, but I approach Rex Ahima and the rest of the group, Greg Semenza, um, and uh, the other editors, and they immediately were very supportive. So I wrote a, an article together with Lizanne that laid out the rationale, the history, how to use it. Uh, and that it becomes a very important document because people have to write protocols, they need to go to their IRB, and at least something that you could have. It. The, the JCI had it reviewed and put on their website within 24 hours, uh, which is remarkable. I mean, they send us the comments, we revise it and put it back. And then we were learning during that period a lot. For example, we were learning about the transfusion issues. We were learning all the problems on trying to institute this rapidly. So about two weeks later, we approached JCI again and said, we now have all this information and we need to put it out again. And they again rose uh, to the challenge. Evan Block wrote a, a very uh, detailed uh, paper. You can see the many authors, many people here from Hopkins. Um, that and both Evan and this is a written from the point of view of transfusion medicine. How do you how do you deploy this? How do you use it? What are the issues? And uh, these two have become very important documents in the deployment of uh, convalescent sera throughout the world. They've been translated into other languages, and uh, and I can tell you more about that later. So during this time, the papers begin to appear from China. So China uses convalescent sera against COVID-19. Again, not controlled trials. You can see JAMA, five critically ill patients. Um, PNAS publishes a whole case series, and then CHESS is another case series. The point of view is that they're, report, they're, they're reporting good results. Uh, whatever you want to think about case series, think that this is the way that penicillin was also approved, or before we had a regulatory agency. But anyway, the, the most important thing, scientists and as somebody who basically you got to always be skeptical i'm not looking at the efficacy data i'm more worried about the safety data i'm worried about the safety data of giving antibody to somebody who's got virus who's clinically ill and the results that they provide provide reassurance that in fact this is uh, going to be safe uh, this is some of the data on the papers it's from pns papers the bottom line if you can see let's look at the look at the side you can see the, the oxygen saturation uh, improve and again they're reporting effects that are relatively rapid uh, for the more than you would expect and on some of the other indicators of inflammation uh, went down radiologic improvement this is from their paper uh, again case series again anecdotes but you can see some these two patients nine and ten they're they had improvement uh, radiologically Italy begins to use convalescence of plasma now they haven't published any of their data but we have been in touch with people who know these groups. And again, they're reporting this phenomenon of people getting better. They want some people responding very rapidly. Again, anecdotes, but uh, we are looking forward. Hopefully they will assemble their data and publish it. But you can see this is what has been reported in Italian newspapers. And I know from my Spanish and of Italian, I can read that la terapia con plasma funciona. At least it works. So the donor criteria, donors uh, was another issue. They obviously had to be adults. They needed to have COVID-19. And uh, initially we were looking for complete resolution of symptoms for 14 days. But then what happened was that about a third of them still had positive PCR for COVID-19. And that could not, they couldn't be used because you weren't gonna send them to a transfusion facility. They, the FDA suggested that we use uh, serum uh, blood with titers of a greater than 1 to 320 as validated by ELISA. I can tell you that the that people, the majority of people make antibody, the majority of people make neutralizing antibody, but the titers are all over the place. They range from low teens to over a thousand of neutralizing antibody. So some of these units are really good in terms of antibody quality. Some of these units are not so good. And uh, that is something that hopefully the, the controlled clinical trials will uh, address as we go forward. Uh, we uh, female um, donors with a history of pregnancy uh, were excluded uh, because of the possibility of triggering trally. So Brooke Williams, the comment is back. Um, so I keep declining and it keeps coming up. Uh, they, they, people cannot 
be currently pregnant and no history of blood transfusion in the last 12 months. The, com the protocol is complicated. And this slide, which is from three weeks old, is already out of date uh, because uh, it's been simplified quite a bit, in particularly as people have gotten more comfortable on how to do this, how to bring people in. Uh, but it gives you a sense of what it takes to, to put this in place. And remember, as so of March 1st, there was no mechanism in the United States for rapidly harvesting convalescent serum, uh, plasma. This all had to be done very rapidly. By the way, you will hear that I often use the word serum. That's because my brain has been shaped by all those old papers, and they used the word serum. But in reality, we're only talking about plasma. So if you hear serum, just change it in your mind. Plasma. So by April 20, uh, early April, there was a major problem. And the major problem was that the supply was vastly uh, less than the demand. And here enters uh, the Orthodox community in New York response magnificently. Um, I had a conference call with rabbis in Westchester, but the person who really gets this going is Chaim Lebowitz. He is, uh, organizes the community and is able to deliver greater than 10,000 donors. Uh, to the to the centers. So Brooke, can you do something? Because this thing keeps asking me to give you control. Hi, sorry about that. I'm trying to figure it out on the back end. It is not me, so please don't click on it. I won't. I just keep keep, keep clicking decline. Okay. Can you see it by the way when it pops up? No, we can't. Okay, good. So it's only me that's getting tortured. It's all right. Um, so um, you can see that uh, this is taken. This is a, a bus. Uh, in which people are, are are brought in and donated, New York becomes the major supplier of plasma. Uh, the Orthodox community to the United States mobilizes. In many cities, uh, they are donating uh, the plasma. Cities that have Orthodox communities now begin to have more plasma than others. And uh, uh, again, the Red Cross gets into the into the picture early April. They are also collecting plasma. And the supply of plasma begins to improve on a daily basis. But even today, the, the gap between what we need and what the demand is, is about two to one. So plasma remains sh uh, shortage. The situation today, as of this morning, uh, the, I learned that we are at 6,500. This slide was made about five in the morning. Uh, I've been treated in the United States. There are national and international networks that have emerged. Convalescent plasma has been used throughout the world, uh, but it remains a scarce uh, commodity. Uh, and uh, one of the issues before I came to do Grand Rounds, I was on a call with the blood industry because hyperimmune globulin is in development. And imagine the following situation. You have a um, scarce resource, and you know that hyperimmune globulin is likely to be a better product in the future. So what proportion of plasma will you allocate to today versus the future? And obviously what we wanna do is we wanna to continue to increase the supply so that these difficult decisions doesn't have to be made. There are now numerous clinical protocols, including randomized controlled trials. I'll mention some of them. Suffice it to say that in New York, uh, Einstein and NYU have one protocol for hospitalized. Columbia has a different one and uh, there is Harvard also have a randomized controlled trials. These are ongoing. And yesterday we were online with the UK, the UK, the British Health Service. It's also launched randomized controlled trials. Uh, the biggest difference between these is the control. In some places they're using plasma. In other places, the IRB won't let them use plasma. They are having to use a saline. But I think that in a month or two, given the amount of activity, that we are not, we're gonna have a lot uh, more data. So today, two big questions. One of them I can give you an early answer to, the other one I can give you a hopeful answer. So in regard to safety, uh, the risk and safety. So what are the risks of plasma? They are the known and the theoretical. The known risks are transfusion reactions. They occur, they are not that common, but they can often occur. And uh, you can also uh, trigger, for example, uh, trally, which is lung injury. Uh, usually, 
um, it's a low probability event, in particular if you screen the plasma. There is some theoretical risk of infectious disease. I mean, there may be a disease we don't know about. Uh, there is the problem of volume overload, although remember, the most that we're using is one unit. And so it's been given slowly. And then there are theoretical risks. Well, you have a disease in which a lot of the pathogenesis is appears to be immune mediated. Are you going to give them an antibody that's going to drive forward the immune response? And then there is the phenomenon that's been described of antibody dependent enhancement. Now, I, from my knowledge of antibody, I feel pretty comfortable that if you took antibodies from somebody who recovered and was well, and you transfer them to somebody who was sick, that you were not necessarily going to run into this. But I will tell you that I, I, I was anxious. I was anxious as to, as to what would happen. And um, I can tell you that uh, we carried out risk-benefit analysis as best as could be done. This is in the blog, JCI, the second paper. And even with very low efficacy, that is, let's say, a 10% efficacy, the risk-benefit analysis based on known transfusion risks was you, you still had a benefit. Um, but now I can tell you that the paper has been written uh, right now. Uh, the, the, so when people give plasma, they have to register at the FDA, and they have to put in information. And there is a data safety monitoring board. And you can read between the lines as to whether you think the FDA would have allowed 6,500 units to be used if there was any significant um, issue or with toxicity. And the bottom line I can say to you is that hopefully the paper will be submitted to a preprint server on Friday and submitted to a journal over the weekend is that there appears to be no major safety issues. Of course, there are always some issues. You're dealing with very sick patients, but I, the uh, data safety monitoring board of which Larry Apple uh, graciously agreed to serve on uh, certainly has not uh, felt that there is a uh, need to intervene. So does it work? Well, we have a lot of remarkable anecdotes, and some of them are in the press already. Uh, the case series have been encouraging. History provides a lot of optimism. This is something that is based on an extensive immunological knowledge. Antibodies work. They, we know how they work. We know how many things they do. Uh, but I will give you a phone. Uh, this is from a, a phone grab that Michael Joyner sent me, and I'll read it to you. This is the day after. Good story. We had a relatively healthy 50-year-old guy on 60 liters of oxygen. Wanted to give him convalescent plasma, but he was delirious. So I guess when they went to ask his brother, the brother had power of attorney. He wanted to think about it. And then they had to intubate the guy. Then the brother gave the okay, we transfused, and he was extubated 24 hours later, last night, and has been weaned down to room air. We won on this guy. Now, you can take that in any way you want. I would only say to you that imagine that, that you gave the plasma, people got really sick. You would take anecdotes very seriously. Uh, so as a scientist, as somebody who believes that we all carry a lot of biases, certainly we all want it to work, I just presented to you as an anecdote. The, we have ongoing clinical trials on prophylactic use, early therapeutic use, late therapeutic use, and even a pediatric protocol. So uh, we hopefully will have answers of the kind of quality that are demanded by today's modern medicine. So I just want to say, talk about the Hopkins trials. Uh, here are three of my heroes. Uh, Shmuel Shoham wrote the prophylaxis protocol. It's a phase two trial to evaluate COVID for prophylaxis. It's randomized, controlled, double blind, multi centered. And you can see the inclusion of healthcare workers, high risk exposure. But they were also trying to see whether you can do, use this on high risk exposure, for example, in a, uh, in a nursing home. Uh, the primary efficacy endpoint of day 28. So if we get enough cases, we'll know pretty quickly. Uh, and the serial assessment of clinical and serologic parameters. At, at day 90. And then David Sullivan has developed an ambulatory protocol. Uh, he needs a lot more cases to show efficacy because what he wants to do is he wants to treat people who are home with COVID-19 who may be getting worse and ask the question, do you prevent them from progressing? Um, Dan Hanley, who as you very well know, um, uh, runs the T, uh, C, CTSA here and is very experienced. 
uh, clinical trialist has, is putting together this large multi-center trials that hopefully, and both of these trials will hopefully begin very shortly. There is now plasma accumulated for this to begin, and it, we are at the end of the logistical process. I wanna thank uh, two individuals of which are allowing these trials to happen. Michael Blumberg gave us $3 million, and Larry Hogan gave us $1 million. And this money does not cover these trials, but it allows them to get going. And get, we think that getting going and just organizing and beginning giving doses will provide a lot of wind on the sale to get additional money to take into completion because the infrastructure is there, the work has been done, and the answers to them are remarkably important to this, to this country and how we deal with the epidemic. But I would also point out the people who brought in the, this gift. I wanna thank Al Summer. I, Al is a friend and I'm happy to, one of my chairs is the Al Summer uh, chair, which, is, which comes if you're chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And we were talking during this time. In fact, I would call Al to get advice. And at one point, I'll say, what do you need? I said, we need money. And he uses good offices to, with the Bloomberg Philanthropies to, to bring this money in. And then I want to also acknowledge Mar uh, Mary Clapsaddle. Mary Clapsaddle of JHU. Uh, we, she, we talked over, or again, a lot of these things for some reason happen over weekends. But she put together the application. The application went to Larry Hogan, and we got one million. Those four million are allowing this thing uh, to get going. And uh, I'm grateful to the donors. I'm grateful to the people who, who brought in uh, this gift. Because in reality, if we figure out how to use this, uh, I think that we will be giving humanity uh, a major tool uh, to intervene in an epidemic that's going to be with us for a long time. I want to end with this slide. Uh, I'm interested in history. Uh, I'm interested in all kinds of history. And um, I'm interested, for example, in the Tocqueville. The Tocqueville wrote, visited the United States in the early 19th century and led out a series of observations about democracy in America. And if you think that the anti intellectual movement is new, no, it was there. The distrust of elites, everything was there. But one of the things that he commented was that there was a can-do attitude and that the freedom of assembly in the United States allowed things to happen that could not happen in other societies, in particular top-down societies. And I want to point out to you that the convalescent plasma project that you've been hearing about, that is now this enormous uh, movement almost that is spread throughout the world, is the product of these advantages that we have in our society the freedom of assembly. We have not had any uh, government help with this. Uh, we have had government help in the sense that those people that we have interacted with in, in the agencies have been very helpful. But this has been totally organized by initially began almost, like a, almost as a society of friends that then grew up by networks to, to this enormous network that is now in, in so many ways negotiating with the plasma industry negotiating and, and, and driving a lot of these uh, to be done. So uh, with that, I want to uh, give you a view, my last slide, the near and far horizons. I think today we have convalescent plasma. I can tell you from the call that I had an hour, an hour and a half ago, that hyperimmune globulin is coming, provided that we can ensure that the industry gets some plasma and that we figure out how to divide this plasma between those who need it now and those who need it in the future. But it's not gonna be available until probably late summer. And uh, once it becomes available, there is a lot of other hurdles. Uh, we're gonna to have to test it. We're gonna to have to see what its relationship to plasma is, as well as we want the industry to make IM formulations. It turns out that they don't make IM formulations anymore. Everything is IV. But if you, for example, want to, to deal with a ship, uh, you know, an, uh, an aircraft carrier, or you have to, to give it to a large number of people prophylactically, you, you really need to have IM formulations that can be deployed in the country very rapidly. I think monoclonal antibodies, I don't know, are coming. Uh, there are some very nice reports already of broadly neutralizing antibodies. So that will re represent a new layer of antibody therapies and hopefully some in 2021, we will get a vaccine. So 
in my view, these are all going to be layered defenses. I think we're going to be using plasma, especially if it is safe, uh, for a while. Uh, and we now have to figure out how to use it. Hyperimmune globulin will be a better product when available. Monoclonal antibodies will provide even, in many ways, even better targeted therapy. And hopefully there will come a vaccine and then we can all get vaccinated. And then once you get a certain amount of immunity, we can defeat this virus. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Larry. I, I, uh, I'm speechless. This was an exceptional presentation. Um, I, I, can hear the, I can hear the clapping in the background. Um, so uh, I know you're, you're very busy. If you could stay for a few questions, that'd be fantastic. I'm, uh, ha I'm happy to stay. Okay. <laughs> it's, only, it's just going to another Zoom call. Yeah, okay. So there, there are some questions in the chat box. I don't know if we want to look at a, a couple. I want to look at the chat box. Yeah. Right. I think there's about read. 10 of those. Larry, Larry, could you pick some of them? I can't see a chat box. Okay, let me, I can get it. Um, um, well, I see a chat box of 25 questions. Some of them are just... Wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. So one of them about is about the shortage of um, plasma and the access to COVID tests and lack of access to COVID tests and whether you think that they will eventually allow donors with antibodies who have recovered from the disease but who never had a lab-confirmed COVID test. So yes, I, I think that's in everybody's mind. If we had a great antibody test that would be reliable, uh, that would be, uh, we would be able then to, to, even if you didn't have, because a lot of the asymptomatic may have great antibody on them. I will tell you that the Red Cross today, if you donate anything to the Red Cross, they're testing it for antibody to COVID, to, to the SARS coronavirus. Uh, for the reason is that they plan, to, um, they plan to then take those units and channel them into either uh, production of IVIG or because they probably don't meet the criteria for using the clinical trials. The clinical trials have been approved with very strict criteria. But so I think the answer is right. I think in two weeks, if I was giving this talk in two weeks, the situation may be very different in terms of testing. Well, uh, one, another question is how does the plasma serum treatment differ from a monoclonal antibody treatment? So in theory, they are the same, right? They're both antibody therapy. And, but in practice, they are very different. In a monoclonal antibody, you have a defined reagent. Molecularly, you know, you have one molecule and you can basically define it almost to, to pharmacologic excellence. In the case of plasma, every plasma unit is different. Every person will mount a different response. So whereas one, you can standardize beautifully with physical chemical determination and study it, you know, kinetics and all that, the other product is going to be much more complex. Is one going to be better than the other? I don't know. I think that people who recover have a lot of good stuff in their plasma. And maybe we'll have to see whether antibodies are better or they are not as, as good as plasma. Mm -hmm. But I, the other question that comes up is what happens with, when the antivirals come? Well, you know that antivirals are going to, it's like every drug, they're not going to help everybody. I, but the history of antibody and drugs is that if you put them together, they work very differently. So if we figure out how to use this, we may make the antivirals work even better by giving people uh, both therapies. Wonderful, thank you. There's also a question that you were talking about the shortage of um, plasma, you know, of it being like a ratio of two to one uh, in terms of the need. So someone mentioned is plasma that is collected from a single donor uh, is, can that provide treatment to, how many people can that provide treatment to, or is it sort of a one-to-one? -one? Lisa, that's a great question. So the answer is the, it's in our favor. A person, uh, a normal sized person can donate to you, can give you two units and they can donate again in a few weeks. Large people can give as many as three units. 
So the math is, is one situation in which the math is certainly in our favor, in that one person can help two people. There have been, and there have been some reports out lately that, um, that the plasma uh, taken from people who have recovered more recently is actually more potent than from people who have been well for a while. And I'm just wondering whether you have some plans to test that or, or what you Yeah, see. so antibody, antibody immunity wanes with time. If you read the 1934 report from the Pennsylvania school, the doctor claims that part of the reason that his was so successful was because he, because he took it from a kid that had just recovered from measles. Whereas some of the other preparations that were commercial at the time had much lower antibody titers, even though they had no way of measuring it at the time. Lisa, could I chime in with a question here? Um, Arturo, um, I do serve on the DSMB for the uh, expanded access protocol. And uh, actually, when I started, I thought it would be dealing both with efficacy and safety. But as you know, it's focusing only on safety. Um, and periodically, uh, Mike Joyner says, yeah, but we're, we're going to assess efficacy, and it's a little bit of a black box. Can you comment on how so, yeah. the plans for efficacy? Because I, I still don't understand that, how they're going to so, be. So um, you know what? It's, they, it's cutting edge clinical research. Um, you have 6,500 6, people treated now. Uh, can you find a signature of efficacy in there? Well, you have a lot of anecdotes but that's not going to be what Larry wants or what I want. So there are some clever things that people are, are planning to do. It turns out that a lot of people registered or could not get plasma. That could provide a control group because the physician thought they needed it, but they couldn't get the plasma. So that provides a control, at least in the intent to treat. The other thing is that uh, working with some of these high-tech companies there is a lot of interest in, in generating AI tools that would go into the experience uh, or the medical record experience and try to create control groups for these patients. That is, you can randomize experience out there in some way and then provide a control. And uh, we are having some really interesting discussion. My view is, that, and then there are the people doing it by, by the old fashioned way, for example, I know that several hospitals have already written up their papers uh, and they are in review in which they are comparing it to the other people in the hospital. They're trying to find controls, uh, you know, manually. So I, I think that there is really new clinical research to be done here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because you're going to have a ton of data. And uh, it's actually uh, intellectually very interesting. Uh, all I would say is that there are a lot of smart people and we... So we have a call every night, the leadership group at nine o'clock, and we think that we can have the safety data by this weekend, and we think we could have a glimpse at the efficacy data in two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'll tell you, being on the DSMB, there are these three groups, the at-risk, the severe, and the life-threatening, and uh, the comparison group might be difficult to identify without taking into account the, the distribution of those, uh, those three groups. Yeah. Arturo, because this session is co-sponsored by the Center for Health Equity, we do have to ask you this question from Deidre Cruz. Um, she says, I have some concerns about access to convalescent plasma. What are the recipient exclusion factors and are smaller health systems and hospitals able to deploy this? So what our hospitals in some ways have been far more effective in, in, in using it. Uh, in New York City, for example, the smaller hospitals in the West Chester academic medical centers, when the academic medical center are treated 10, they had treated, they had treated hundreds. I think it's highly variable. Uh, in some places, the, the community hospitals were able to, to reach out to, to people that they knew were donors. Uh, and they did it very effectively early on in other places. It, all I would say, Lisa, is that it is an individualized experience at this time. This is a grassroots movement occurring with no coordination. Mm -hmm. And it is remarkable that one can go from idea to 6,000 people in, in, in two months. Uh, and, and everybody's still on the same page 
trying to figure out how to do this right. Mm -hmm. So the, the process is not so resource intensive or and the exclusion criteria are not so uh, rigorous that you, you, you don't have concerns that certain places will be un, unable to do it or that certain patients will be automatically excluded because, you know, I don't know, uh, comorbid conditions or, you know, other factors. I I, I don't know the, you know, haven't thought about it. I can tell you that the cost of a unit of plasma provided by the New York Blood Center is relatively cheap. It's in the order of a few hundred dollars. If you think about a dose of an antimicrobial, a high end or something like that, uh, if you consider, you compare that to the dose of intravenous gamma globulin. So in fact, this is a relatively low cost therapy that if we can figure out how to make it work, people will donate their blood. Uh, this is, we're not talking about high-end uh, compound that needs to, that, that costs thousands of dollars per patient. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I don't know the answer otherwise. No, I mean, but we're at the beginning of this, so I'll right. be looking out for, for those things. Yeah. I see there are, there are more questions. I don't know if you have time or if we I can. have time. I, I, so I see what I'm supposed to do next. Hold on. I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah, I have time. So there's a one question asking about whether you think, I think this is a, I'm not sure if this is monoclonal antibodies. It's a shortcut to S protein from other coronaviruses that cross react could also be used against SARS-CoV-2. Right. So one of the things that always irritates me in immunology is the term cross reacts. I train as a physical chemist, and to me, reactivity is reactivity. If it cross-reacts, it binds to it. So as far as I have some affinity for the, for the uh, agent of COVID-19, I don't see why it couldn't be used. Uh, I, th I think it thinks either react or they don't. And uh, if, if, if it's raised to another coronavirus, and if it binds to this agent, I'll say, give it a shot. Okay. Did I miss other people's questions here? When convalescent serum plasma doesn't work, why is that? And what would interfere with the efficacy of this therapy? So I think that's an easy question. I mean, obviously today we're giving product that is highly variable. You, some people are getting plasma with neutralizing titers over one to a thousand. Other ones are getting plasma with neutralizing titers of less than 65. So one possibility, obviously, is the quality of the plasma. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is that the disease differs in different people. You know very well that even our most effective drugs, mm -hmm. you have a patient with sepsis, which you know the organism is sensitive to an antimicrobial. The antimicrobial often cannot save it because the damage is so extensive. Mm -hmm. So I think that all these things will hopefully will get a better handle of this in the next couple of months. Okay. So this is uh, Socrates from Colombia. I understood your focus for the moment is on prophylaxis. Do you have groups of critical patients from ICU being treated? Yes. Actually, most of the treatment of those 6,000 patients have been people in the, all of them have been in the hospital. So, and, and I would say about a third of them have been in, in ICU. Once the FDA gets the extended range, physicians have been trying to move earlier and earlier. So a lot of treatment now happens when doctors think that this patient is going to decompensate. And uh, we, that's going to be another variable in trying to analyze all this data uh, because it's being used earlier and earlier, whereas in the very early days, I think it was being used strictly as compassionate, which personally, I don't think is going to be that effective because if we learn anything in the, the pre-antibiotic antibiotic era is that antibody works best when given early. So a couple of more questions, hopefully not too long. Um, uh, Dr. Slow wants to know from case reports, have there been serious side effects? No. Okay, good. Um, one other person, Clive, it sounds like, does your work show that actual infection immunity is feasible? I, well, this is a question that I'm asked a lot, because especially when there have been all these reports of a reinfection. Look, the, what we know is that this, this, or, this virus elicits neutralizing antibody responses. In immunology, if you tell somebody that they have a neutralizing antibody responses, 
historically for the last 120 years, this is correlated with immunity. Is it gonna be lifelong? I don't know. Measles, you get lifelong immunity. But flu, you get only a few months, even when the vaccine works. So I think we, the jury should be out, but if we have to get a vaccine against this every year, hey, we gotta get a vaccine every year against the flu. And if we can protect our society and our way of being with a vaccine, you know, ideally it will give you longer immunity, but if it doesn't, I'll take it. And so I think someone asked about whether there's perfect timing to obtain the plasma. So the perfect timing, we don't know, but, but we know that at day 14 and day 28, people have good antibody responses, such as the FDA said, if you can't measure antibody, use it anyway. As to when to give it, that's a big question. And I think the big effects are going to be found in the ambulatory trials like David Sullivan is planning on doing because I think those individuals are very early on and if you were to give there before they tip over if you were to give them neutralizing antibody you are much less likely to see a decompensation requiring the person to go to the ER. Well we don't want to uh, take up too much more of your time we definitely appreciate uh, everything you've done there are so many amazing comments in the chat box about how uh, enthusiastic and inspired everyone is about all the work that you and your colleagues have done and we're just uh, inspired by your courage and your perseverance and your ingenuity and um, we you're very kind but I, I assure you that you know this has been an all hands effort and this uh, the people that I work with is the people who have pulled it pulled it off. Uh, you know, people, sometimes the news media says, you invented this. I said, yeah, really? This has been known for 120 years. I mean, the, my only contribution to this is that I just happened to know about it. And I may have been sort of like uh, the early town crier. But I think that, you know, it would, somebody would have probably figured it out and used it. Look, the Chinese were using it. So, you know, I, I, I say, you know, I'm okay, but please, you know, safety credit for the people who really put this on the ground. Said like a true. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.